<laughs> yes, hello. <laughs> Jonathan Swift here. Um, we are technically, we're lost. Absolutely lost. Not a clue where we are. But uh, just because the map doesn't say that we are anywhere where we think we should be, it doesn't necessarily mean we're in trouble. Because you see, we are at least... Well, we're at least here. I mean, we're somewhere known as here. So when you are here, you will always be saying, "Well, I'm I'm standing here." So we're not we're not technically lost. We're just um, we're just here. And um, once we figure out where everything else is in relation to here, we'll be fine. Now I don't want you to panic. That's the important thing when you are lost and the maps don't help anymore. I, I, it, panic is absolutely not going to help you uh, in the slashes. No, uh, pa one panics when, for example, fruit juice is soured uh, because it's been in the uh, Sherpa's barrels for too long, for example. Or or when uh, the fruit juice is, say, perhaps um, a sort of pineapple, kiwi and strawberry concoction, which why would anyone want to combine those things together with a sort of a, a dash of mango in it? just for, for exotic flavour. No, no, that's when one, when one panics. But I, I don't drink fruit juice. I only drink milk, and of course that can't sour. So the uh, Sherpa barrels, which have been sitting here in the tropical heat all day, should be absolutely fine. So there's no reason to panic at all. You've got Jonathan Swift on the case. We'll have a map of here pretty damn quickly, if I do say so myself. No need to panic. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Campaign Creator Series. Well, we're back to talking about maps. And I think that there cannot be an overemphasis on how we need to use maps within our campaign. So by now, your maps will have taken on a life of their own. Hopefully, you've been generating maps for territories. You've been generating maps for buildings, as we have looked at in this series in previous episodes. So today, when we look at maps, I'm going to take you through some of the pitfalls, some of the dangers that maps can inherently bring to your game so that you can avoid them. Now, this is part of campaign creation, in my opinion, because you as the creator need to decide upon the balance between how many maps and what kind of maps you include in your campaign creation process. And you're going to see that sometimes you don't want maps. So let's have a look. Let's see. Why do we use maps in the first case? Let's jump into that. So why do we use maps in the first place? Maps are incredibly visual. They really are visual in terms of being able to look at something. So let's jump over here. I've got a map. This is the map of our um, territory known as Zutheros, Utherios. Maps are incredibly visual. When you look, oh, when you look at this map behind me, you are seeing forests and lakes, Nessos Lake, Ios Lake, Phallos Lake. All of these lakes, you are seeing lakes, you're seeing borders, you're seeing forests, you're seeing mountains. There is all kinds of things that you are seeing in this map. So it's a very visual thing. And that's important. It's visual. If I jump on over to, to this map here, this is a castle. Let me give myself some more space here. This is a castle. It's very visual. We're seeing the barracks. We're seeing the statues in the courtyard outside. We're seeing a dining room of uh, more barracks, for example, or the armory. So the maps are very visual. And that's something that we've got to be very very cognizant of is that maps are visual and we as creatures we like visual things and this kind of ties into a few other things as well maps are also very tactical the moment we see a map we start going aha i could hide there i could hide here let's go back to that map this is the castle i'm in dungeon fog here and uh, we are looking at this. Here is the main entrance. We can see the double doors. This map I made quite a long time ago when Dungeon Fog was quite new. I, mean, I was actually looking at it going, hey, maybe we should update this um, with all the new stuff that's come out. But the idea is maps are tactical. So if you look here, there's a little blind alley. It's only five foot wide where my mouse is bouncing up and down. Only five foot wide. That's a choke point. Anyone with a 10 foot reach weapon is going to struggle to maneuver in that space. There's a blind corner here. Yes, there are these torches all over the place illuminating things, but it's still a very narrow space. This courtyard out here, 
one exit, which is five foot into the wall. These were designed for specific reasons. So there's a tactical nature to it. If I go over to this map here, which I designed in Wonder Draft, uh, Wonder Draft, of course, allowed me to create all of these different zones, the roads, the territories. These are dirt roads. So when we look at it from a tactical perspective, if you wanted to invade Thermos, for example, from Pyro, you've got to take a dirt road or go across the wastes of Dordu, and they're not going to be called the wastes of Dordu for no reason. There are there are going to be things in those wastes. So maps are very, very tactical. That's that's a good thing. Maps are it's a, it's a good thing that maps are tactical. So we need to bear that in mind. And what that does is, is it engages different senses. Maps engage different senses. So not only are they visual, so there are people out there who look at things and they it allows them to really be in that space. And again, that's what I love about um, programs like Dungeon Fog or if you're building three-dimensional terrain, if you're actually making stuff as we've seen on other, there's so many other um, things out there where you can actually make the walls and Papercraft Dungeon and uh, DM Scotty's YouTube channel and making stuff. I mean, there's just so many, so many different places, DM's Craft as well. So if you make a map, you're getting a visual, you're getting a tactical. Now, the tactical can come back to bite you later on, and we're going to see how that happens uh, a little bit later on in the video. But basically, it's about engaging different senses. So remember, when you're sitting around the table, if you're theater of the mind, theater of the mind is amazing, and I am a theater of the mind GM. I will always go theater of the mind before I go anywhere else for that matter. And I was thinking about why, 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 why? Maps give us such a wonderful thing that, of course, aside from giving us positional information as well, you are here and you are there and that's where that is and that's where that is. So maps are really, really powerful and really useful. We just have to be careful with them uh, as to figure out how they work and what they can do to ruin our game. So let's have a look here. How much detail? That's a question we need to ask. How much detail do we include in our maps? Now, this is again a personal choice. It's something that's that's something that you're going to have to decide. So let's break it down. Let's have a look and see. If we include personal detail. So let's go back here. Let's go back to this castle. And I'm going to zoom in here. Uh, oh, I've got to click on the right um, uh, thing first. Wait, where am I now? Oh, yes, we're busy zooming in. It's busy loading up all of that data. There's so much data in this map. It's a huge map. And I've got the second floor already uh, loaded in here. So if we look at this kitchen, let's recenter on this kitchen a little bit. If we look at this kitchen and we and we oops, not that button, this button and we go in closer, hopefully. Uh, he said we go in closer. So like I said, uh, my computer is doing all sorts of things that's struggling. Right. So we go in here. We've got a chest at the top. We've got stairs going down into the basement. We've got stairs going up to the first floor. We've got a fireplace, um, cooking hearth, some pots and things. We've got a table. It's got carrots. There's there's a recipe on the table. Uh, there's all sorts of drinks and things that are being prepared. There's the chair of the cook, I suppose. There's the wash sink, another oven here with something on the boil. So there's lots of detail in there. There's lots of detail. And I think you're going to see where I'm going with this uh, when you get the idea of what we're talking about. So there's lots of detail here. If we go to the geographic map where we've got all of these different island chains and, and things like that. If we zoom out, there's lots of detail, lots of detail. But there's also not a lot of detail. The fields of Nembros. Penembros has nothing. There's nothing in Penembros. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Why? Because it allows us to add in information. So maps give us the personal. People who live in this castle, they eat carrots. They have shopping lists for food. There's a certain amount of personal information that's shared there. They also give us details and they inspire. So if we look at our map, We've got this inspirational territory. I wish I could point to it, but my, my camera doesn't go that far. We've got this inspirational area around Casadol where there is nothing. But down here by Janatos on Boy Lake, we've got this sort of swamp detail happening in here. And we've got some mountains happening here. So this plain with a few little trees near Casadol and the Asikias wood is interesting. What's happening in this space? So it allows us to 
inspire us to add in more detail. If we put in all of the details, so if we have everything in there, there's a little, there's little room for us to add in stuff, but it inspires us. Oh, look, the kitchen's having carrots. It detracts if we put in information that maybe doesn't make sense. They're having carrots, but aren't they carnivores? Aren't no do 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 gnolls eat eat carrots? Gnolls will eat anything, but my point in case is, oh, I thought this they have carrots here? That's interesting. Wouldn't have thought that, you know, this particular castle is a carrot consuming castle. So they can distract if you put in too much detail. Again, it's a balance. It's a balance and it's a personal preference. But what happens? when we start adding in realistic or descriptive stuff, when we start looking at it and we go, oh, you know, ah, this map, this continent wouldn't ever exist. It's a completely illegal continent. Um, why would there be forests down here and swamps over there? It doesn't make sense. Geographically, there's a, a geographic plate that would sit here and that would cause mountain ranges over there. You can go that far. But you can also go too far in terms of, let's go down here, let's go to this barracks room, where we start to say, okay, well, this, this, this dormitory, this dormitory, when you walk in, you've only got a two and a half foot gap here between the table and the, the brazier. You've only got five foot between the two beds. You've got five foot to the wall. Uh, so, so that's your combat space. You can't move over the bed. It's difficult to rain. You can't move around these chairs without moving them out of the way. Um, do you see where I'm starting to go with this? Is that the more information you put into your map, the more penalties are going to come in terms of realism. So we're getting there. Now imagine if you have one character sitting here in this, this little gap into the garden, this overgrown garden of the keep, and you've got several characters trying to attack in. You now suddenly have a great responsibility from a tactical perspective to say, well, only three characters can actually attack the character who's in the square. And the square, in theory, would have half cover from these two attackers because they're trying to attack around the corner. Okay, so one character can quite easily defend against three. That's why they built these things in this shape, by the way. Almost always there was a recess in to allow one individual to hold off an entire line of individuals. It was very, very smart. And even when you get into this corridor, you still only got two points of attack opportunity as the ingresser. You've got to fight to get every inch in this particular space. And again, that's why it was built this way. That kind of makes sense. So... You start to run the risk when you start adding in realistic or descriptive stuff of flummoxing yourself. So how does that happen? How does one flummox oneself? Let's go and have a look. Let's go and have a look. So this is a problem. It limits your options. I'm going to start here rather than going there. I'm going to start here. It limits your options in terms of if you now say, OK, let's go to the map, let's go to the map. And the characters, the characters are trying to fight their way into this castle. They don't have the tactical defensive, offensive knowledge of a war general. So they have described that they have climbed into this garden, which you have so beautifully rendered here. And they climbed over this little wall and they avoided the plant trap and they are now at this door. But somehow they got seen. Perhaps it was from this corridor. This um, this is a double sectioned wall. Maybe there was a guard in there. They saw them. So now the three of them are busy fighting here. They've moved this water barrel out of the way, by the way, because that's completely occupying the one square. So they've pushed that barrel out of the way. And now they're trying to get into the castle. But they've been stupid about it. And they're in this space. There's three of them there. There's one guard standing here holding all three of them off and an entire bevy of guards over there because we know that they they have a barracks right here. So the guards are easily able to get there. The guards easily can come out of the main castle as well and just flood across this open garden to attack our players. They have nothing that they can do. There is literally nothing that they can do. They're going to get shot at from archers one floor above. Both sides are going to be shooting down at them. They could hide maybe behind this statue. But the problem is, is that the players, the players lacked the tactical wherewithal to make better use of this space. That's a suicidal entry point for three, three characters. One character should have tried to have sneaked in 
unobserved, opened up a door somewhere else. The kitchen is, oops, the kitchen is a far better place. Let's let, let, let load up. The kitchen is a far better place to gain entry into. So the options that you have as the game master, you start to run these risks of trapping yourself because you overestimate the capacity of your players or your players walk through your dungeons because you overestimate your own abilities to defend a space that you've created. So that's point number one. Point number two is it will slow the game down. It really will slow the game down. When you go to a map, let me just uh, reload this one. When you go to a map, when you have a tactical map and your players are busy running around it and they're busy doing stuff, it slows the game down because there is, it's going to happen. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. The players are going to sit back and go, well, I can see that corridor. I can see that. And even if you're playing with Fog of War, they're still going to be looking from a tactical perspective. Now, normally, this is what would happen in real life, is you would be looking. Uh, so let's go back to this map. So let's say they are here. I've now put the roofing back on. So they're in this little corridor. They're going to be looking for options. There's a guard post just down here. There's this cart. There's a horse that's going to give them away. They're going to slow down as they go, oh, maybe we should try and climb onto this thatch roof and get onto this walkway up here. Mm, is that something we should do? There's a tiled roof over here. Maybe we should go down this way. You know, so there's so many different routes that they can take. It slows the game down. So you have to be aware of that. That's one of the negatives I find big time is that the role playing stops and the tacticians come out and they forget about their characters and they go well my character's a cloistered monk maybe they read a book on tactics but it's unlikely that they read a book on tactics in blind alleyways it could be argued the other thing is, is that it can take a quick location or something that should be a quick location. It can take a quick location and slow it down. So it's an invasion of a cottage. Oh, it should just be easy. The cottage is two rooms. But because you now add in a map, the players slow down. They suddenly start looking, going, well, we could attack the map from that side or from that side or from that side. So that is going to slow your game down. So if your game is feeling like you're running out of pace or if you're constantly, okay, it's a new location, happy spending six hours whilst you figure out the best way to attack it. By not having maps, you remove these problems but you introduce a whole bunch of different options. Players who can't visualize spaces sit there going, oh, I don't know about, I, could, do we go left? Is there a door to the right? So you spend a lot of time explaining stuff. There aren't the visual advantages that you have of that map, that tactile sensation of being able to look at the map and see the map and interact with the map. You lose that, my wig is slipping. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a thing. Um, you, you have those kind of problems. So maps are, are very good, but you need to learn how to use them to your advantage as the storyteller, not just as, oh, well, I'm a dungeon master, so I have to have maps. When you're creating your campaigns, these are the same things. Some set pieces are amazing. Not everything, though. So if you've stayed all the way to the end of this fairly lengthy video, they always seem to get fairly long, don't they? Let's go and look at some bonus stuff. So what else do maps do for us? Well... They provide atmosphere. They really do. They provide atmosphere. And when you look at things like, um, let's go here. When you look at this castle, uh, let me try and zoom out. It's going to try and load up uh, all the pictures. Um, so when, when you look at this castle, it's going to load up. Uh, we're going to come back to it. But um, there is a definite atmosphere. This is the castle at night. There is quite a lot of light everywhere. But at the same time, there's lots of little shadows out around the edge of the castle. There's lots of shadows in the center of the courtyard. There's lots of shadows. I could imagine dalliances happening between the lady of the castle or the daughter of the castle and the stable hand, uh, for example, happening on these statues in the, in the shadows. Lots of little areas. So the tone, the atmosphere is definitely generated when you're generating maps. So atmosphere is a big thing that those maps can add. And although you should be describing dark and shadows, lurk and skulk in the corners, threatening to hide a thief or a pickpocket, or perhaps concealing lovers locked in an embrace, 
describe absolutely but by giving a map your players instantaneously get a sense and get a feeling as well so that's really important geography is another thing and i'm not just talking about geographic maps in terms of oh look we've got this 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 castle here you know we've got this this layout we've got all of this kind of stuff i'm not just talking about this kind of geography i'm talking about the geography in terms of the layout so okay this character's over there this character's over there that character's over there and all that kind of stuff that's really important it's also important that that very same geography doesn't become too prohibitive. Now, we've seen this happen a lot where characters are in one city, maybe they're in Zolos, and you've established beforehand that to get from Zolos to Abanjiro, which is on the other side of the map, takes two weeks because of crossing the uh, Diosabidi Mountains. Perhaps you now have a situation where you've got two characters, one at Zolos and one at Abanjiro, and the one in Abigenero really needs the help of the one at, at Zolos, but they don't have three weeks or they don't have two weeks. So geography becomes important. You can ignore it at your peril. If you have a map, players are going to be going, but it, but, but, but it took us two weeks last time. It took us three weeks last time. Things like that are important. Look at Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit as to how those were handled. Things were glossed over. Things were glossed over. Uh, oh, yes, you, yeah, you've got that little thing. And yes, you get through it. It's not too much of an issue. Or you don't get through it. And it's the entire book. One has to play with one's geography. And then finally, plot spawn. I love maps for plot spawn options. I create a map, as you know with this series, very early on. And then I come back to it later on when I'm running my game. And I look at that map with fresh eyes. And I go, you know... There's some plots that are going to happen here. Let's let's have a look. So some very quick examples. Let's say we are here. Our characters are in Lemuri and there is this Belosso Marsh that's in front of them. From Lemuri, they want to go to Zopli and they've decided that they're going to not use a ship. They're not going to sail across uh, the Moor of Dardan. They are going to instead try and trek across the swamps because in low tide, the Bay of Daphne gets completely cut off, isolated. So they start to trek across the swamp. You could, because you haven't planned anything, just describe the swamp. On the other hand, I feel that that is an opportunity lost. Your players, provided that this fits within your gaming time frame, should be encountering things that happen here in the Belosso Marsh. Who was Belosso? Why is it called Belosso Marsh? And this Moor of Dardan, it's an oceanic event. We can see that labeled in the map. It's got a blue outline around it, so it's referring to this watery area. Who is Dardan? And a moor usually means a mouth or a giant opening or a, a, a void, a rent in something. So what is this moor of Dardan? It could be a monster that stalks the Belosso Marsh. It could be a gigantic catfish, Dardan. And the moor of Dardan is that it completely swallows horses whole. And as a result, that is why bridges have not been built between Zopli and Lemuri. And they prefer to either sail out into the ocean, go around, or they'll take the long road all the way around, which is highly unlikely. But nonetheless they will take a ship instead they will sail out into the axic sea and um, see where they're going rather than through there so maps can inspire let's go to this dungeon fog one we look at this rooftop not a huge amount of inspiration there but if we look over here and we look at the garden why is this garden important what's happening in this garden let's uh let's go to the ground floor so we can see it better so we go to the ground floor as it loads up the garden what's in that garden and who planted it and why did they plant it that's the next question to ask why why did they plant this garden i keep hitting the wrong button um why did they plant this garden what is it? you know there's this venus flytrap that's in the garden that's interesting there's a plot just in here. There's an adventure just in here. If this castle is where your characters are based, they can go around this garden. There can be herbs in there. There could be dryads that are living in there, that plant, this big um, Venus flytrap. It could be sentient. Uh, someone could be stealing from the garden. You know, so these plots just spawn out of your maps. That's really powerful. That's really useful. Definitely something to have a look at. So maps, in my opinion, are really powerful, but they need to be used sparingly so that you don't end up losing time to irrelevancies and that the maps enhance your game. 
Until next time, I wish you and yours the greatest of uh, map making. Just a big shout out to World Anvil, Dungeon Fog, and uh, Wonder Draft for the various maps and the different services provided therein uh, in terms of displaying all of this kind of stuff on today's show. If you are not part of them, I suggest you go and check them out because they make pretty cool maps, let's be honest. Until next time, however, I wish you and yours the happiest of map making. <laughs>